It's Andy, and it is good to be here on a Palm Sunday, and we're super excited about uh, this whole week. Uh, of course, yesterday, great, big, incredible day, and uh, some of you may be new. You came here and uh, ended up coming to our service, and we're just glad you're here. Welcome, and uh, love to get to know you, and love, just would love for you to know that uh, we care about you, we're here for you, and want to help you take your next step in your spiritual journey. Um, and then, of course, on Friday, you're going to get the postcards. I think some of you have it. It's Good Friday service at 7 o'clock. It's going to be a great evening, especially because there is no sermon. So uh, it's going to be a great, great evening. <laughs> golf, golf clap, maybe? <laughs> Fine. Okay. And uh, thank you. Uh, and then, of course, Easter. And uh, the festivities start at 8 o'clock, so don't miss it. Get here for the pancake breakfast. We did have a problem yesterday. We had two people cooking pancakes, uh, Chuck and Daniel, if you're here somewhere. Uh, big competition. It was like, are my pancakes better than Daniel's? And Daniel's, my pasta better than Chuck's? And uh, got tense. So I pulled him up into the office. We had to do some forgiveness, some healing. They came back down and finished the pancakes. It's all good now. The conflict has been resolved, and uh, they will be cooking also on Easter. So anyway, yeah, we're good. We're good to go. Got a little, got a little tense there for a while, but we, we worked it out. So and all the kids in the petting zoo, and Patty, are you here? Patty, yeah, you okay? Patty got hurt, injury, survived, was helping with the petting zoo, bleeding from the bunny. So yeah, the bunny. So we took that bunny home, and Kelly and I had a great dinner last night. <laughs> hey, this is an adult environment, everybody. This is an adult environment. We talk about adult things in here, so please do not send me emails. It's like my kids run church. They shouldn't have been. They should be in the children's ministry area talking about children's stuff. So anyway, and that's happening, and so Easter. Make sure to invite a friend. Invite a friend. Two times a year people come to church, and that is Christmas in. Easter, so make sure to invite a friend, and they'd, they'll thank you for it. It's going to be a great, great service. And, uh, and I just want to take a moment right now and just pray. Um, we've had several things happen this past week. Uh, of course, uh, you know, the tornado, I think 23 people passed away is what I saw in the last couple days. Is that right? Uh, 23 people and, all, and also the shooting in, in Nashville, which uh, just again, I think we as a nation, like no other time, we need the local church. We need a healthy church. Healthy churches working together and uh, working through this, that uh, what our society is going through and the damage and the pain, um, mental illness, and uh, just, you know, the idea of getting a gun and shooting somebody, it's just evil in children. Uh, it's just evil. So I want us to just take a moment and uh, pray for those two tragedies. So let's bow our heads and pray. God, um, you know our brokenness, and our world is filled with brokenness and sin. And so, Lord, we pray for healing on our nation and in the world. And when you came 2,000 years ago with the angels, uh, they, they proclaimed peace on earth. And God, that is your desire. And your very beginning in Genesis was harmony in the garden between people, human beings, man, woman, and the human beings and families and with you. But God, I just... Um, Pray again for harmony, for peace on this earth. And so, Lord, I lift up the families who've lost loved ones and the teachers who pass away and all of their families, the, the hurt, the brokenness, the um, lack of words, the grief that's happening, the shock, and we just lift them up. And also for those who've experienced the, the pain and the loss of their homes and uh, even lost loved ones, 23 people passing away, Lord, uh, with the tornadoes, we lift those families up, the communities, and uh, just let them know that you're God, and uh, in spite of our brokenness, in spite of a broken world and fallen world, you're still in charge, and you still love us, and you give the power and the grace to get us through whatever circumstances that we know that you're God. And so, Lord, we lift the families up to you, and uh, we lift our nation up to you. We lift up those with mental illness. God, you know who they are. You know what's going on and what they're thinking. And God, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would just stop it, that the devil would want to disrupt and kill and hurt and destroy. God, I pray for the churches, I pray for Christians, that we would walk the talk, that we would have the courage to be bold and intervene and to come into people's lives and heal and be your hands and your feet. So Lord, we lift up the church to you. In Jesus' name. 
Amen. <clears throat> and like no other time, that's why Jesus came. And uh, <clears throat> I mean, some of you who grew up in church, you may have been handed something. It was called a bulletin. Did anybody ever get a bulletin? Anybody grow up in church, get one of those? And at the very top, I grew up in the church, Methodist church, mom and dad, Methodist pastors for years and years, and uh, 45 years, but who's counting? But anyway, and uh, growing up in church, I'm not bitter, but uh, they always handed you, they always handed you a bulletin at the very top. It would say the order of both, both, the service and also worship, exactly, the order of worship. And so we all worship. Even if you grew up in church, if you know history, if you know what's happening as far as any sort of, just even in our society, I meet people and they say, yeah, I'm, I'm spiritual, I'm spiritual, don't, need to know, don't know if I need to know, go to Malibu Pacific Church because I'm spiritual, and I just, everywhere I go is just spiritual, I say, yeah, but you haven't seen the Easter egg hunts and the pancakes are incredible, so <laughs> you're missing out, you know, by not going to church. Uh, but we're spiritual, we worship. The moment you say, I'm spiritual, or um, yeah, I believe there's something out there, you are worshiping something. We as human beings are worshiping something or someone. So here's the definition of worship. Worship is just this. It's to recognize someone or some, something's worth or recognize something or someone's value, the value of something. So when you say, this is valuable, this is valuable, in that moment, I am worshiping it, right? I'm saying there is value here. Uh, there is worth here, and I'm recognizing its worth. So when we're singing, and sometimes I say to people who've had a bad experience in church, or just come to church and just sing, and don't listen to the sermon. Just go, just worship. We even said it, Curious said, we are going to enter into a time of worship. So our songs are recognizing the worth of God in our lives and the value that God has for us. That is a worship experience. Well, that's been going on from, from the very, very beginning, from Genesis chapter 3 on, from the ancient world. So for all of the history majors out there, I'm going to go through the entire Bible here in 23 minutes. So hang in there. Actually, the history of the world in 23 minutes. But from the very, very beginning, people have worshipped. You've worshipped something. And let me just throw this up. Uh, the, the world would worship things by, by killing something in order to get the gods to do something for you. So you need your crops to, you know, have a good season of crops and, and extra wealth. So you would sacrifice something to the gods. Hopefully there's some god out there that I would say to these gods, I am sacrificing something in order to get you to do something for me. Um, I, I, you know, we don't have any children, and so we'll sacrifice something in order to get the gods to bless us with children. Or we'll sacrifice something in order, um, you know, to have our business go better. Whatever it is that somebody is needing or wanting, you are sacrificing to the gods to get the gods to do something for you. And here's the thing in the ancient world, and this is where this comes from. The, the greater the value of the sacrifice, the more that you're begging or bribing or asking the gods to bless you. So you would sacrifice people, or even in the ancient world, would sacrifice children because they were of value in order to get the gods to bless you. That's the way the world is. And this is how they operated. Just, yeah, a sacrifice equaled a bribe. In other words, you're trying to bribe the gods to do something for you, to get them to give you something. So it was a you know, an economic or sort of a, you know, an exchange that you would have with the gods in order I would bribe you, I'm going to give you something, I'm going to sacrifice something so that you will give me something. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. That is the ancient, ancient world. And then comes along the people of God, the Hebrews. They weren't called Jews yet in this point in history. That God came to them uh, through Abraham and then Isaac and Jacob and started the story with a family, a man that became a family, that became a nation, that became a kingdom from which Jesus came from, for which we are celebrating here Palm Sunday of what Jesus did today, which has to do with the sacrifice. But Jesus, I mean, sorry, God is interacting with the Hebrews at this point in history and saying, we, do you want to have a relationship with me? And you can read it in Deuteronomy 28, this agreement that God wants to have with the people. God doesn't abuse boundaries. He asks the question, do you want to have a relationship? So in Exodus chapter 19, some of you may know, Exodus 20, something happens. Exodus 20, 
Charlton Heston goes up to the mountain and he gets, there were 20, but he broke 10. So they came down with, that was an old joke. But anyway, he, he came down with 10 commandments with the rules. But the rules did not happen. This is a whole other conversation, a whole other talk. But the rules do not happen until after there's a relationship. You see, when my wife and I got married, the, the rules didn't come after until I, we said, I do, right? All the rules happened later. But we said, do you want to live together, be together, to love and to cherish the rich or poor, rich sickness and health, till we die, you know, till the end of our lives? Yes, that's it. Okay, take out the trash on Tuesdays. But anyway, here's all the rules. The rules come later. Exodus 19 is actually very important. God comes to the Israelites or the, the, the Hebrews and say, do you want me to be your God? Do you want to have a relationship? They say, yes, great. So we're going to change the sacrificial system of sacrifice is a bribe that what I am giving you as Hebrews, there will be a sacrifice, but it's not a sacrifice for a bride. In other words, when you are my children, you are my people, you're in. I don't need you to do anything in order for me to give you something. Like a good parent loves to bless their children. And no matter what you do, I will always love you. Now, before you go into the promised land, I want to teach you how to live with each other. So let me give you the Ten Commandments. So that when you go into the promised land that you are going into, you will know how to live with each other. And we are going to begin to change the world by this remnant people called the Hebrews, eventually the Jews, on showing the world who God is and how to relate one another. Not to get God to do something for you, bribe, but I am going to give you something, a gift, to help you get along with each other and get along with God. So the sacrifice is not to get the God or gods to do something for you. A sacrifice for a Hebrew or a Jew is to forgive me of my sins, or the word is atonement. But God changes the relationship by a covenant or an agreement and showing to the world on how God wants to be connected and relate to his people. I mean, Solomon was one of the kings, and he said this. Um, He said it in Proverbs 21.3. He says, to do what is right and just is more acceptable to the Lord than, everybody, a sacrifice. I'm not interested in your sacrifices for a bribe. You don't need to bribe me. You don't need to bribe me. You are my my children. We have a relationship. I am more interested in what is right and just on how you're relating to one another than trying to bribe me. Uh, You know, David, his, his dad, actually said this in Psalms 51. You do not delight in sacrifice, speaking to God. God doesn't delight in your sacrifices or or I would bring it. That's actually easier. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. You, you, God is not interested in that. God is interested in how we're relating to one another. And so he's, he's just saying, um, I, I, I just don't need that. So what, what I am bringing or introducing to people is a word here that you may have heard it before, but it's called atonement. In other words, you have sin and I have sin, and, God, and what we are saying and sacrificing to God is saying, God, forgive me or atone for my sin and help me to treat one another. Why is God so interested in how we treat one another? Just like a parent, you take care of my kids, you've taken care of me. You hurt one of my children, you're hurting me. So he's saying, learn to get along to one another, and also he's speaking to a slave nation that they were always told what to do, where to go, what time to wake up, what time to go to bed, and what pyramid to work on. And so they learned from the Egyptians on how to relate to one another. And God's going, that system is backwards. The ancient world is always the strong, is the might, is what you get what is right, and you get what you want, and you can kill somebody, you can destroy somebody. In order to understand the rules that God gave to the Israelites or to the Jews or to the Hebrews was revolutionary in the ancient world. In the ancient world, you didn't like somebody, you killed somebody. Become king, become strong, become powerful. You write the law and you can do anything you want. Women had no rights, children had zero rights, and as far as society, there's a few wealthy and everybody is poverty, and you get to do and control whatever you want. And God comes along and says, no, 
There needs to be justice. There needs to be what is right. Human beings matter. Every human being has value. Every human being is a child of God. I mean, it is revolutionary. For us, to, for me to say that today, you're like, yeah, of course, why not? But in the ancient world, that would have been, it's revolutionary in the ancient world when you understand the context of history. So the Israelites and the Hebrews at this point say, God is saying, I want to give you a sacrificial system in order to atone or make right. Here's the definition of atonement. At one, make at one meant. Get it? Atonement. Make at one, to make one, or to make at one, to reconcile, as in uh, reconciling your checkbook, if anybody still has one, or to cover over. It really means to cover over. Can we all say that together? Atonement is to cover over. In other words, everybody has some sin. I don't have very much sin because I'm a pastor. <laughs> Just a little bit of package sin, right? I have a little, and you can see it. But atonement means you can't see it. Once a year, every Jew would have the day of atonement, which is to cover over your sin. So you can't see my sin anymore, can you? It's still there? It's, hang, it's hanging out a little bit, yeah. You can still see a little bit of my sin. But I've tried to cover over in the Day of Atonement. This is what they did once a year to cover over. And here's a great picture of what would happen in the ancient world. That the high priests of the Jews would come together and they would bring a goat. And once a year, the Day of Atonement, that the high priest and the entire community is together, would lay hands on the goat and say, we are going to put our, as a community, sins on this goat. Just representing what we are doing. That God will forgive us of our sins and put the sins on the goat. And everybody would come together, everybody goes, yes, God, forgive us of our sins. Represent what God is doing for us. And then the high priest would take the goat through the town, through the city, throughout the, outside of the, 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 the city doors or you know, walls, and take it out as far as it could, out into the desert, representing to the people that my sins have been carried out of our community. It would happen every year. Here's the problem. It was only good for one year, and we have to do it all over again. It didn't get rid of the sins, but our sins were carried out of our community, and it represented it with the goat. And for a couple thousand years, the Jews have done that, and the Day of Atonement, even to this day, that the, the goat is taking out our sins. It covers over our sins for one year. And then a few thousand, 2,000 years ago, an amazing thing happened. There's this guy by the name of John the Baptist. John the Baptist came. He was a wild man into the will, out of the wilderness, the cousin of Jesus, proclaiming one message, one word sermon, repent. Okay, come to church. Let's hear a sermon. Repent. Let's pray. So anyway, we're done. That's it. And get ready for what is coming. Get ready for what is coming. Get ready for what is coming. He's crying out out of the desert. He was a wild man proclaiming that, that someone is coming. The Messiah whom we have been praying for is coming. Uh, our deliverer, our king who will deliver us from what they were thinking was the Roman occupation. He's, he's a wild man. He's saying, repent. And even, here's the sermon, basically. I'll just read a little bit to you. He said this. When he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees, when it, many, he was drawing up, they said, everyone was coming to see. All people were there to see John the Baptist. Um, uh, might be a bit of hyperbole there, might be a bit an exaggeration. I don't know. It's kind of like saying everybody was at the, everybody was at 
at uh, Bunny Jam yesterday. Well, it wasn't everybody in Malibu, but there were a lot of people. It's kind of like saying, you know, everybody was there. Well, it wasn't quite maybe everybody. And also John the Baptist, a lot of people were called John. So you need descriptions. And so uh, John the Baptist went to the Methodist Church, he went to the Presbyterian Church, he went to the Catholic Church, and he went to the Lutheran Church, and then he went to the Baptist Church, he said, I want to be a Baptist. <laughs> just kidding, there weren't any denominations back there, just, are you with me? Okay, anyway, so John the Baptist means he was baptizing people. And if you were a Gentile wanting to become a Jew, there was a whole ceremony that you needed to do. And one of them was circumcision, so not a lot of men joined the church. But anyway, this is an adult environment. But anyway, another one was baptism. Uh, there was an eating of a meal and then also a baptism to wash away your Gentileness to become a Jew, the people of God. And so he would say this in the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They were the religious leader. They were the power brokers. They were actually the ones who put Jesus to death. Now, the Pharisees weren't fair, you see, and the Sadducees were very sad, you see. <laughs> That's an old, old junior high camp joke. So anyway, I didn't know if that was going to go over well. But anyway, and then he says this. Here's his sermon. You brood of vipers. He's pretty much swearing in the Greek, just so you know. It's like, no swearing in the Bible. No, John the Baptist, he called it like it was. <laughs> Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Repent, repent, repent. And then he would say, keep going, verse, verse 9, And do not think you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. Um, in other words, they were, the Jews were claiming that because we're children of Abraham, we're automatically going to heaven. Look at who we are. That's sort of like saying, my grandma was a, attended, was a member of the Presbyterian Church, you know, 40 years ago or 50, 60 years ago, therefore I'm going to heaven. No, each generation needs to discover for themselves and make the relationship personal. So don't claim grandma, grandpa, uncle was a pastor in Oklahoma. I don't know. He's saying because of your heritage, that doesn't guarantee anything for you and for me. <coughs> Excuse me. I tell you, that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. In other words, your value, Sadducees, you religious people, <laughs> there is no value in claiming that you have something special over everybody else. God is not interested, stay with me, in your sacrifices. God is interested, back to Deuteronomy, on how we treat and relate to one another. And the way you're treating people is not what God would have you do. God's not interested in your sacrifice at all. Sadducees, Pharisees, and Jesus is coming. Then one of the most powerful emotional verses in the Bible. John says, go ahead, Alex. <clears throat> John 1, And then the next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him, and he said, the most, this is what the purpose of the church is right here. This is why we exist. Look, there he is. Our only job as a church is to point people to Jesus. That's it. There's Jesus right there. It's not about me. It's not about you. Look, don't miss this. I mean, he's, he's breaking history and how the sacrificial system, that it went from bribe to cover over to now look, the Lamb of God, everybody, who takes away the sin of the world not the people not our community on a on a goat but the sins of the world and he's making the analogy what we did with the goat the lambs or a sacrificial system is now being put on jesus look the lamb of god who takes away the sin of the world. Don't miss this. I mean, it's from bribe to cover over. I am going from bribe, God, I'll do this in order to get you to cover my sin for a year, but it's still there, to take 
away my sin. It's gone. It's out. He takes away our sin. I mean, what Jesus is doing is more than forgiveness. He is saving us. He is taking away our sin. Okay. <coughs> I mean, <laughs> gone. No, that's okay. I don't think we really believe that, do we? We don't. Oh, I'm going to mess up again. I steal my stuff. You don't know what I did. You don't know where I've been. You don't know my history. You don't know anything. No, he takes away your sin. Uh, Philip Yancey said this in one of his books. I think it was on Grace. Great book. He said, God took a, a huge chance by giving the gift of forgiveness before ever anybody was ever born, before ever knowing what you and I've done. The gift has already been given. So you and I say, well, I can or I shouldn't. Well, God's not going to love me. He's like, no, it's already been paid for. I mean, it's already been given to you and to me. So whatever we ever do, we're like, oh, God's not going to forgive me. I don't know if I can or God, you know, I can't go to church. or what. No, the gift has already been given to you as a forgiveness, you and I, not only forgiving us, but taking away the sin, cleansing us whole. And so... What Jesus does, he goes into Jerusalem. Before that, he even had the chance to be there, if you've ever had a chance to be on the Mount of Olives and looking at Jesus, where Jesus was, where he prayed that prayer, but also he looked at Jerusalem and Jesus wept. The smallest, shortest verse in the Bible. He weeps for the people. And then they give him a donkey. He goes into the city. Go ahead, Alex. And the people cry out and say, Hosanna, Hosanna the highest. He is the Messiah. He is our king. What they said was true. They were thinking, though, he's the king who's going to Messiah, who's going to deliver us from Rome. And Jesus doesn't argue with anybody. He says, no, what you're saying is wrong. No, I am a king, and I am the Messiah. Just not what you think or what you're expecting me to do. I am not just going to take away... <laughs> I, I'm not here to be the king. I am here to be the Messiah to take away your sins. So he goes into Jerusalem on Thursday night. Uh, he has Passover, and it's the new covenant that the world operated, that you sacrifice to get a bribe. Our people have operated for thousands of years that, um, you know, we do a day of atonement, and it covers over. Now I'm coming in to take away the sin of the world. He goes into Jerusalem. They cry out, Hosanna, Messiah. And he says, what you're saying is correct, but not what you think I'm going to do. Friday gets arrested, beaten, or that night, Thursday night, then Friday, and died on a cross for us. Even before that, read the passage there through the scriptures. They say, do you want Jesus or Barabbas? And everybody's like, Barabbas, Barabbas, sucre. take him away, Jesus. Same language of taking away our sin. And he goes and he dies on the cross. And so Friday, that's why we're here. And we will pray and we're going to have communion and we're going to worship because of what Jesus did on the cross because he died for us. He's the sacrifice. Not to take away, I mean, sorry, not to cover over our sin, but to take away our sin. Hebrews a writer said this. We're not sure who the writer was, male, female. We don't even know who it was. Hebrews 10.1 is this. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices, be repeated endlessly year after year. Make perfect those who draw near to what? To worship. The sacrifices that we think, if I do this in order to get God to do something for me, that's a shadow. That's not even how God works. That's not worship. And then it goes on. He says, it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to, everybody, take away sins. See, those sacrificial systems and the idea that I do something in order to be better or gooder, if that's a word, in order to get God to do something or love me more or get something that I want God, God's going, it's impossible with any sacrifice. God's not, God is not impressed with your sacrifice or my sacrifice. 
What he gives us is the gift of grace. And he takes away our sins. You see, here's the point. Jesus came to replace the entire sacrificial system. He changed the way the world has been operating and we human beings have been operating with God for centuries. And I love this. And just finish with this. Romans 12, 1. Many of you are familiar with this. What kind of sacrificial system does God want? Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true, proper worship, how we live. Let me tell you, friends, like no other time do we need Christians walking the talk. We don't need Christians with a lot of information. We need us to live it and do it and be a light and salt of the earth. So here it is. Jesus did not come to cover over our sins. Jesus came to take away our sins. And that's what he did when he went into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday to be the sacrificial lamb for you and for me. Amen? Amen. The only thing we need to do when somebody offers you a gift, what do you do? Receive it. Yeah. Just say, God, take away my sin. And because of what Jesus did on the cross, he takes our sin, our backpacks, and he, I guess, throws it down the canyon. I don't know. Is that far enough? I just looked out. It looks, wow, that looks like a big chasm down there. But that's what he does for us. Amen? Today is a great day for you and for me to receive the gift of forgiveness, that God would take it away. Imagine the freedom that you and I will feel. Imagine no more shame, no more guilt, no more remembering, oh, look at what I did in the past. God's going, no, you're forgiven. So I just want us to open our hands up here today if you feel comfortable to do that. There's no magic in this. It's just something that's happening in your hearts. Today is a great day to get away from the bribe system. A lot of people still do that today, to get away from the, oh, it's covered over, and we do a lot of covering over and try to pretend with people. But Jesus promises to take away our sins. And all we need to do is say, God, forgive me. Take away my sin. So let's just bow our heads and pray that. As we open our hands, our hands open just simply represents that we're willing to receive this gift. Closed hands means no. Open hands means yes, God and a surrender, a posture of surrender. And just pray with me quietly in your seats. Dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me, for being the sacrificial lamb to forgive me of my sins. God, forgive me for being, or having the thought that I need to bribe you, or I just need you to cover over my sin. God, thank you for setting me free free from the things that hold me hostage in my life, and it is my sin. Break me free from it, God. And right now, with our hands open, we receive your gift of forgiveness, your grace, and your love. God, in return, we give you our sin, no longer on a goat, but we place it at the cross in the name of Jesus. Thank you for setting us free from our guilt, our shame, our brokenness, our sin. God, we can walk out of here today crying out, singing Hosanna to God be all the glory because of what you did for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. Please stand with me as we close.